Good evening, everyone. If you're still outside enjoying the food, stay there until I'm done talking and enjoy yourself. Okay. Please turn off your cell phones or put them on mute, and then I'll do mine when I get back to my seat. Good evening, everyone. I'm Marcella Schulach, the director of the Shindy Rudolph Graduate Program in Creative Writing, and I'd like to welcome you to the 10th Biennial Shindy Rudolph Graduate Program in Creative Writing Conference at bar -Ilan University on this, the second night of June, 2024. Also, the 25th day of Yar, 5784. It's the 18th year since Shandy has passed away. It's the 22nd year of the program's inception. We just finished celebrating 76 years since the founding of the State of Israel. And as you can see, there are so many ways to count time. And it seems that we have been doing nothing but counting time all together for a very long time now. At sunset, it is the 41st day, which is five weeks and six days of the Omer. In Kabbalah, each of the seven weeks of the Omer counting is associated with one of the seven lower Sfirot. You guys know that, right? Chesed, Gvorot, Peret, Netzak, Chod, Yesod, and Makut. And similarly, each day of each week is associated with one of these same seven Sfirot. And I'm gonna bring this up not because I'm a Kabbalist, but this is my next book. So, <laughs> through the period of the Omer counting, we move from slaves to a self-determination. Another way of putting it is that we move from a collection of individuals and family members into a story, a history. And accordingly, this week is the week of Yesod. The attribute of Yesod is literally foundation or communal bonding. And Yesod is the foundation upon which God built the world. And it also serves as a transmitter between the Sfirot above and the reality below. Within the week of Yesod, we are now as it would be in the day of Yesod, and it's the bonding of the inner reality with the outer reality, the bonding of heaven and earth. All of our mental and emotional traits work together to move forward with focus, although I'm sure it did not feel like that when you were trying to get here a few minutes ago. <laughs> And our focus is on bonding with one another on a personal and communal level. So we are preparing for Shavuot, when Jews receive the Torah and become a people. And we have just completed Pesach, when we tell our first national narrative. And you can say that's what makes us a people. An Israeli state within which is a Jewish people. And it's our story and our narration. And so for the next three days of the conference, we will continue our godly work, our bonding work, the work of Yesod, by celebrating stories, whether fiction or nonfiction, prose or verse. We will hear three exceptional storytellers during the period of our conference. And I'm just gonna give you a tiny preview. Um, we have Joshua Cohen tonight. Tomorrow we will have Ruth Franklin and on Tuesday, we will have um, Ido Geffen. Tomorrow morning, we begin with a day of panels, workshop, prize ceremonies, and we will have readers from all over the country, free lunches, a mime, <laughs> Jerusalem stories. Don't let tonight scare you. It's not gonna be this bad tomorrow, I promise. You all know how important the celebration of Jewish Israeli writing is as we count the 240th day of the war with Hamas and we think of the hostages who are still captive in Gaza. And we remember all the civilians and soldiers who have been killed in combat, all of the ones who've been killed in West Bank and Gaza. And as we do this, we are acutely aware of how difficult, how dangerous, how brave it has become for Jews and Israelis to narrate today as our most important literary institutions are being pressured. 
And in the face of all of this, you can always remember that it could always be worse. <laughs> it has always been worse. And it, we have survived, right? We have survived. And we will survive. And so we're just going to celebrate three days of writing, three days of godly narrating making. And thank you all very much for being here tonight. I'm going to turn this over to Evan Fallenberg, who is going to welcome you as the chair of our department, and to just give a small regard from Dean Daniela Dweck, who would love to have been here, but she had previous obligations. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure and my responsibility to welcome you to our conference this year. Normally, it would just be my pleasure, but somehow um, pleasure feels a little too lighthearted. And it seems like everything we do these days, including our pleasure, carries a measure of responsibility to it that I don't remember having before. In, um, in April, I did a month-long residency in, uh, in Iceland and my two sons came to join me for a week while I was there. It was nothing short of a miracle that um, our plan, which was made long before the war, came to fruition. We were and still are at war. One son served for months on the northern border and the other one was deep in Gaza for far too long. One son's wife was in her eighth month of pregnancy and actually could be giving birth right now, as far as I know. And Iran sent its barrage of missiles just days before the boys were due to fly. And while we were in Reykjavik, we enjoyed probably the best meal that any of us had ever had at a Michelin star restaurant. And afterwards, we talked about whether it was right or okay to do so when the hostages are still far from free and so many Israelis are still displaced from their homes or grieving loved ones, and so many hapless citizens of Gaza are still suffering daily. We didn't come up with an answer, but I'll give you my answer now, since it's just as relevant to ask whether it is right or okay to hold a creative writing conference when none of the conditions I just mentioned have changed or improved. Without art, without crea creativity and invention, none of the rest of it matters. It is what props us up and keeps us sane in the most dire and challenging of times. It is what defines us as humans. So let us spend a few days losing ourselves inside art and creativity, even if we do not forget for even a moment that we are immeasurably privileged to be the people charged with carrying on, with upholding, with creating an environment for art to flourish, while so many others are sentenced, hopefully only temporarily, to focusing on nothing more than their own survival. We owe them the best we can do. Thank you. As Dr. Kara Glatt makes her way to the stage to give us a Dvar Torah, I just want to really thank all of you for being here. And I want to thank especially Karen Berkowitz, um, Vivian Lezorek, uh, Cohen Lezorek, and um, Rachel Hensevit, yeah, not Henderson, for all of your work and for putting all of this together with me. Also, Hagit Solomon, who isn't here tonight. Let me just make sure. You can hear me? This microphone is functioning? Okay, great. The Torah portion for this week is Parsha Bamidbar, the first of what is in English called, as Joshua Cohen could tell you, the Book of Numbers. Appropriately, the Book of Numbers opens with the census of the population, or more specifically, a count of all the men of fighting age, defined here as those age 20 and older, and excluding the Levites who are enumerated separately. The number recorded in this census is just over 600,000, and it is from this number, the number of adult men who left Egypt, that arises the rarely said blessing, Birkat Hacham Harazim, to be uttered upon the occasion of seeing 600,000 Jews in a single place, one of many lesser known brachot that are invoked from time to time to commemorate encounters with strange and wonderful things. Yet as the Torah scholar of Yiva Zornberg, who will be speaking at this conference tomorrow morning, has observed there's a dark undercurrent to this initial census, and indeed to the entire book of Numbers. Not long after this census is taken, 
A group of spies are sent to scout out the land that they have been promised. Ten of the twelve return with a dismal report. The land is flowing with milk and honey, but also beset by enemies, giants of insurmountable strength. This is a land that eats its inhabitants, they say, and the people lament and regret having left Egypt. As punishment for their lack of faith, God decrees that none of the adults of the generation, defined again as those, those uh, from 20 years and older, will enter the land. The Israelites will wander for 40 years, during which all the condemned will die in the wilderness. Yet while the punishment is articulated clearly enough, Zornberg observes, the narrative continues with little sense hint of the passage of time and its bitter harvest, to the point where it is a shock to be reminded on the occasion of, the se of a second census taken at the end of this period that not a single person counted in the first now remains. Even after this, when Moses, himself precluded for a different sin of faithfulness, faithlessness from crossing the Jordan, speaks to the people, he, the, speaks to the people, he speaks to them as if they were the same generation who had left Egypt and witnessed the attendant miracles and revelations, though we know that only a fraction of them, those young enough of the Exodus to have been exempted by the curse, can indeed have experienced these events. Almost without our noticing it, an entire generation has vanished, the nature of their death strangely obscured. Some commentaries and responses perceive the 40-year period as one of successive, super, or unnatural tragedies. A story in the Talmud Yerushalmi holds that for 39 years following the decree, each year in Tisha B'Av, which, among other catastrophes yet to come, is believed to have been the date of the spies' report, the generation of the condemned would dig graves for themselves to sleep in overnight. In the morning, the survivors would wait to discover that 15,000 of their fellows had died, and so on and so on, each year until the last year of wandering. According to one Midrash, Miriam, whose death in the wilderness is recorded in the Torah, was the only woman of the Exodus generation who died in the desert, in accordance with the common rabbinic understanding that only men, and not women, were included in the sin of the spies and the resulting punishment. This reading, which would seem to ignore that, many, that the likelihood that many of that generation, cursed or not, would have died naturally in the 40 years that intervened, imagines the death of the men, rather than the survival of the woman, as the exceptional event that requires supernatural justification. Yet, of course, there's another reading, one perhaps more consistent with the plain text of the Torah, which explicitly links the length of wandering to the span of time it will take for that generation to die out. To be sure, for all the men in a population over the age of 20 to die in a 40-year span would be unheard of barring some cataclysmic event, especially given that this particular population includes among those exempted Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, all of whom lived to 120 or beyond. Even so, the youngest of the condemned would have been 60 by the end of the 40 years, an age that is, with apologies to some of my senior colleagues, not considered young even today, and would certainly have been, without supernatural intervention, well into old age by the standards of a pre-modern society lacking med modern medical knowledge and subjected to the harsh conditions of an unforgiving wilderness. This is indeed supported by the fact that the Torah does not, in describing the census, feel the need to set an upper bound as to what constitutes fighting age. Perhaps because the number of men above what might generously be construed as suitable military age was negligible. If one picture of those 40 years then is one of relentless tragedy, the other is one of something resembling ordinary life, in which knowledge of looming mortality coexists with the mundane joys and sorrows of everyday existence. The heavy punishment of the generation of the Exodus is that they cannot enter the land of Israel. But in the meantime, they are given 40 years, years to love and grow and experience to raise children and welcome grandchildren. It is at once a condemnation and a reprieve, not capital punishment, but a suspended sentence beneath which lies living, breathing human life. Countless generations of their descendants have lived and died since that time. They have entered the promised land and lost it and returned once again. Those of us who number ourselves among them find ourselves today in a time when we, well, we, we may well be tempted to ask, with the generation of the wilderness, why does the Lord bring us to this land to fall by the sword? Which the numbers we count too often are those of the dead and not the living. In the days after October 7th, it was impossible for many of us to imagine moving forward with anything resembling normalcy. In many ways, it still is. And unlike our ancestors, we have no divine decree to tell us when and how the horror ends. Whether it is we, our children, or anyone at all who will merit finally to inhabit a land 
flowing with milk and honey, and enjoyed in a lasting and enduring peace. Yet in the meantime, we live. The first children conceived after October 7th will be born at the end of this month. Bringing children into the world is an affirmation of life. So too is creating art, an act that stands against negation and nihilism, and asserts that there is something worth saying and communicating and preserving. This conference, which many of us, I know, did not believe could take place at all this year, celebrates that act. It commemorates also the life of a woman taken from us too soon. I never knew Shandy Rudolph, who died years before I came to bar -Lan. Yet over my years on this campus and at this conference, I've come to know her through her legacy and through the many who remember her and keep that legacy alive. When Moses delivers his final speech to the children of Israel, he speaks as if it were to the generation of the Exodus, something most of his audience cannot possibly have personally experienced. They knew it through the stories of their parents, who in those 40 years that remained to them, learned perhaps to speak again of miracles and promises kept, who learned to, to become storytellers so vivid that the children could one day see themselves and be spoken to as if they had experienced it firsthand. Shandy Rudolph was given only 40 years. She did not have children of her own. Yet in another Talmudic commentary on the Midbar, Rabbi Yonatan explains that the sons of Aaron are counted also in this parsha among Moses' children in order to teach us that to be someone's teacher is to become, in a sense, their parent as well. In that sense, all of us today, whether we learn from Shandy personally or have benefited from her influence, are part of her legacy, joined in a continuum in which the space between those present and those absent can vanish in a breath. We can only hope to leave half so rich an inheritance behind us. I thank her and all of you for continuing the tradition. Thank you. That was, just, that was very beautiful. Thank you, Kara. So I'm now, um, we now move to the part of the program where we are really blessed with the presence of Joshua Cohen. Um, I've been I've been like meeting Joshua Cohen, we met several years ago, but I've been meeting him the past couple of weeks reading his books, and I'm just very excited to have the opportunity to speak with him. Um, he's written a lot of books. He wrote Wits, which Harold Bloom referred to as one of the four best American books of the century, with Nathaniel West in company. Um, then, of course, the Book of Numbers, and Moving Kings, and the book for which he won the Pulitzer Prize, The Netanyahu's. So I, I thought today, um, Joshua was going to read for us in a bit. I, I did refer to you as a super genius, which I know sometimes you're introduced like that. I'm yeah? so much a genius, I don't know which microphone to use. Right. <laughs> right, listen, feel right at home. <laughs> so, um, this one, this one, this one. This one. When, did, uh, when did you arrive in Israel, Joshua? Uh, what time is it? <laughs> uh, six hours ago, maybe? Six, five, Seriously? six. Seriously? Yeah. Uh, this, you, you plan to come in five hours before the, the, the event? They, they canceled the flight out of Riga and we were put on another flight, but yeah, yeah. You know. well, we're, we're, we're How long should I come? Should I <laughs> we're glad you made it. Anyway, Joshua's going to read, but I'd like to read the last passage of the Netanyahu's, which is part of the, um, I don't know what you call it, the afterword. Um, um, I, I hope I'll give it justice. This is a letter that's signed at the end. Dear Joshua Cohn, I've just f finished reading your book, in quotation marks, and I'm going to say it once and for all, and that's it. Judaism is just another word for the patriarchy, block quotes, and for patriarchal hegemony, block caps. We're all one people, the human people with no differences between us. The planet is ruined, machines are taking over, and none of this Jewish crap still matters. Wake up, bold. No one reads books anymore, and the Jews are either on the wrong side of history or just irrelevant. If you're having an identity crisis, I'm sorry, but your only choice is to expand your consciousness and join the human people in our common struggle against pollution and technology, or spend the rest of your life crying for a past that, let's be honest, couldn't have been that great if this is where it leads. Everything you believe in never existed, including your individual self. If you ever believed you could change that, Admit it. Even literacy is dying. And when the last old Jew of you is finally as dead as God, this proud non buried dyke, yes, dyke, is going to dance naked as hell on his grave. And it's signed J.C. 
New York City in 2020. There are so many Joshua Cohens, as we'll find out this evening. So I, I want to ask you about this passage. But did, is, is JC, will, will we find her on the, in the Palestinian Liberation Zone in the South Lawn of Columbia? Oh, God. What is this Columbia bullshit? It's not important. <laughs> oh, it's, yeah. yeah, it's not important. Why? People care about Colombia because it's class betrayal. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's, you know, people with money in the upper middle class care about other people in the upper middle class who are betraying their common values. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, they're, 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 they're kids who, it's funny, you know, uh, a friend of mine had the best response to that ever. He said, what, um, what COVID was to the protesters mm -hmm. was what World War I was to the Germans. Flesh that out a bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the World War One, you know, the Treaty of Versailles, deeply impoverishing, and you would say driving the Germans crazy, um, destroying the economic reality and, and 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 chances of at least a generation and a half German youth, um, and we all know where that led. A few decades later. So, you know, this is our own smaller version. You know, these people graduated high school with COVID. Um, they, meaning they missed high school. They went on to university. They, and they're acting out. It's not like they have weapons. They're just, you know. I like how we got there immediately. We immediately got to the South Lawn of Columbia University. A place where well, people pay $80,000 a year to shit in a bucket. <laughs> it's, not, it's not important. So, and by the way, it's not important also because you read every Israeli newspaper and they're just covering Colombia. No, 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 hold on one second. The thing that's important, the thing that's important is CUNY, right? It's a public university, a public okay. university, which is actually a university that has a, 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 a very, very large immigrant um, and Muslim population, which is a state-funded university and which are governed by entirely different rules. But everyone focuses on Colombia because people are attractive there. Uh, <laughs> I, but I, you, you've talked about um, the trivialization of history. Mm. And there's one particular podcast where Joshua is interviewed for two and a half hours by these two woke, woke people. At one point in the broadcast, I don't, she said something to the effect of petting and drive-ins or something. It was very mid-century. And Joshua exclaims, genocide was very mid-century. And, and <laughs> we were probably both correct. <laughs> But it, it seems that what's ever happening, I mean, at, at CUNY, it's much more ideologically driven in, in, in the sense that it's driven by Islamic fundamentalists. At Columbia, of course, it's all being driven by them as well, but it's packaged differently. And, you know, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be surprising to hear on the South Lawn, join the human people in our common struggle. You know, that's too nice for the South Lawn of Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 again, I, I don't... I, in a conflict where thousands are dead, you know, in, in, in where, where everyone knows someone or is related somehow to someone who's dead, not to mention, you know, civilian deaths on the other side, you know, to, to care about what some idiot does on the upper, upper west side of Manhattan is, is morally obtuse. It really is. I mean, you know, and, and, and to think also that in some way that these student protests are unofficial legislators, it's, 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 it's not true. What it provides is an easy narrative so that when, when Joe Biden loses the election this fall, they can say yeah. it's because of the students, so they can say it's because of the Jews. Okay, but, but, but to put so much value on, um, on, on this protest, on, 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 on peaceful, largely misguided, largely historically ignorant protest is, is to give people way too much credit and too much of a platform. I mean, it's not hard to find idiots or hateful people in this world. I, I just felt that there are, how many, there are many Columbia grads I know in the audience. Um, and I, I, just, well, I just woke up every morning. I came all this way to be in an audience with people who graduated from Columbia. <laughs> I should have just stayed at home. It would have been the... Yeah, um, I just felt that every time I turned the news on, I felt that I was on the Truman Show, because there's Philosophy Hall, there's Hamilton Hall, all these right. places that I knew very well. Anyway, but since, listen, you're, you're, I can see that you're... No, I, I, I think the, the main question I have for tonight is, 
how does, how does writing change after October 7th? And really, in the context of this, history, prophecy, and art. Well, I didn't even see that. Yeah, right. okay. History, prophecy, he does all of those things. And one of the weird things about reading this book, really reading all of his books, and I found this especially true of the first part of Wits, is you feel like he's a prophet. And the first part of Wits is this kind of Kafka-esque, I don't even know how to describe it. It's simultaneously very particular, but also universal in the sense of the universality of Jewish history. And we see the suffering and the empty seat. And you think, my God, right? He talks about the empty seat that's always at the table. And this book, of course, was written years ago. So there is that sense in Joshua's book that he understands. We talked about this briefly over email. Joshua's part of the currents of Jewish history. We feel him as a, as a Jewish novelist, and not in the sense to ghettoize him as a Jewish novelist, but in the sense that he has the awareness of what it takes to, have to, to claim that position, to be a Jewish novelist. So that's really the question I have for you. I mean, and I'll, 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 yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, that's very nice. You want me to agree with you? I'd love to agree. No, I don't want you to agree. It sounds wonderful. I, I don't want to agree. It sounds wonderful. No, I don't. Thank you. Thank you. Thank no, you. Sir, thank I, you. I don't want you to agree with me because okay. um, you said you say you don't want to be a demagogue of your own opinions, yeah. and every book must contain its its counter book. So then I'll, I'll I'll ask you a little bit about just strategy in this book. So I'm reading the next. Well, hold, hold on. Yeah. I can hold on. Yeah. You know, so the the question was writing changing after October seventh, yes. right? Yeah. 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 And and. I think that, you know, it, it's so crazy to think writing would ever change. You know, that writing would change after the Shoah, that writing would change after last Wednesday, you know, that writing would change at any point. I mean, I think that, 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 that in fact, the, the obligation to write is, um, is constant. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, tragedies can provide focal points, they can provide, um, they can provide moments upon which to meditate, but in many ways the entire process of Jewish history is, um, is to negate the uniqueness of an event, right? I mean, that, that was the, the, the homologizing principle of Jewish history is to, is to essentially see these cycles and the idea that you know, that, that one thing represents another, that every temple is destroyed on Tishbab, that, you know, that, 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 that every year you, 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 you talk about Yerid and you talk about the excess from Egypt, and all of this stuff is, is just to, to inculcate this feeling of eternity, right? The Yushalmi idea of, of, of cyclical history, the Jewish version of cyclical history. And my argument is essentially that that concept of, Jewish history, which historians have claimed, is basically just a, a fairly sophisticated description of literature. Mm -hmm. You know, where writers are always comparing one event with another. They're always finding the seeds of one event in another event. And I think one of the functions of, of writing is to sort of remind people that nothing ever begins when they thought it began, mm -hmm. and nothing ever ends when it's said to end. And I think that that, um, you know, and, and, and that task that continuous task is, is interesting to me. Hmm. You've, you've spoken about the metamorphic nature or possibilities implicit in literature, that through recognition, through recognition of the other, I can, I can write myself. And you speak about that as, as a responsibility. And this is, I'll ask the same question again. Um, have, have the possibility for that metamorphic transformation has the, has the community that that addresses, has the pluralism that informs that, has it, been, has it become constrained? And, and if not, why not? I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, in speaking with, with, with Israeli writers who are friends of mine and, 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 and Jewish writers, American Jewish writers, you know, there, there is this sense, I think it was, um, who was it? I think it was Doron Rabinovich who said um, that on October 7th, um, Jews in the diaspora became Israelis and Israelis became Jews in the diaspora, right? And, and the idea that, that, that these elements of the Jewish world were linked through these political events, right? Or through, you know, or even if you want to say metaphysical events, mm -hmm. right? And, um, 
And I think that that, to a degree, is true. I think there's a, a way to kind of interpret that spiritually. I think there's also a way to interpret it technologically. We're just in a highly connected world um, where, 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 which enables those linkages. But I, I, I don't necessarily know. I mean, every, you know, Jewish writer in the diaspora wants to write about Jewish stuff. And every Israeli writer I know just wants to get, wants to write about getting fucked up in Berlin. <laughs> so, you know, but I think that that's part of writing is, you know, you want the thing that you are not or the thing that you don't have or, you know, you, you write to compensate for the absence inside of you. And I think, you, you know, everyone takes their own account of the size and shape of their absence and then projects a character into it. And, and so writing begins. What does that mean, you project a character into your absence? Well, I think, you know, you, you know who you're not, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 you know, I think part of the, like, the first task for me at least, you know, maybe not just as a writer, but as, you know, someone tries to function as a human when he's not writing, is, is, is to, you know, is to know, is to know what I'm not, not in a way that depresses me or frustrates me, but at least provides me sort of a canvas to, to, to act on. Um, I think what it means is understanding that, you know, I was born how I was born, to the parents I was born to, in the city I was born in. I write in the language that I, you know, that I write in. Mm -hmm. These are not conditions that I either can change or want to change. Some of them I'd want to, and some of them I can't. Um, but, you know, given this condition, um, which would be envious to many, mm -hmm. um, I, I then proceed from there. And I think that part of that imagination is then to think about the other ways it could have been, the other historical pathways it could have taken. Um, I think that begins with thinking about family history and where certain members of family went. And, but I also think it, it, it also comes from some negotiation between the culture I was, or the cultural inheritance, if you want, I don't know what that is, uh, you know, that I was raised with, and then the moment in which we live, which is um, in many ways deeply opposed to um, many of the values I was brought up with. Mm. You, you say someplace that you're much more interesting than to think of yourself as a one person. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, does anyone think of themselves as a... So maybe since this is a writing audience and we're talking about this... I like I, how you dodged that question, that was I, good. I, I, that was good. Uh, my, I, do all, I do it all the time with my yeah. students. Um, so, I, I, you said during COVID that you didn't write a COVID book. Are, are, are you going to write an AI book? And can, they, can an AI book be written? Or have you written an already in book of numbers? Can buy a book? Yeah, I mean... I, I don't really... It's, it's really hard to write a story without people. I mean, I think that's the, you know, I think it's, it's it, and, and in a way, I think, you know, artificial intelligence is a word that is used to collect a lot of different concepts and a lot of different things that have kind of nothing to do with one another. Um, what's, what's interesting is that, is that um, you know, there was a, 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 a cult, I guess, of prolificity, of to be prolific. Um, that um, that I think is deeply ingrained in a certain um, certain different traditions, but traditions that were always very interesting to me. Mm. Um, and certainly, the novel um, in in its heyday is about prolificity. It's about um, you know whether it's the Balzac or Zola idea of being able to write many books or, or long books. Oh, thank you. Um, or is this a sign to stop talking? No. no, no okay. Keep talking. Keep talking. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, uh, or, or the idea of the novel constantly accumulating pages and characters and sort of burgeoning and becoming um, broad and wide and thick and, and, and you know the the idea of, of books you know almost growing like plants like flowers. And, um, and I think that, that, that there's a, a, a richness in, in that tradition, um, but at a certain point, 
it became almost as if the novelist was competing with technology. Where, um, I mean, certainly you saw that in quote unquote postmodernism, and you see that from you know, the legacy of, of the American postmodernists, international postmodernists, into writers of the 90s and early 2000s with the idea that, that a writer has to keep up with technology. Can you just give us some examples of what you mean by that? I mean, I, I mean many examples. I mean, like specific writers. I mean, I think that, that, that in the work of Thomas Pynchon, like it, it, it's sort of explicit. It's an encounter between humans and technology. I think in, in someone closer to, to you know a generation older than me is probably David Foster Wallace, which is the idea of you know can can, it, can a human in a, in a way generate text and generate um, narrative strands in a way that seems to me to replicate technology and the way links work and the way linking works. But I think that I think that that so many of us have been outside of the novel. So many of us feel in competition with technology, right? Where in a way technology provides a model for where our art or our life could go. And that becomes a very dangerous thing, right? I, I'll never generate as much text as a computer. I'll never be able to contain as much ideas as the internet. But I think that um, in a way, that sense of a human competing with technology that has been around sort of since the early days of, of the Industrial Revolution, right? Like a, a human competing with a steam engine um, are over. And I think we're kind of just at the beginning of understanding that, that we're not in an artistic competition with technology, but that technology can kind of be used to produce things. And so I think it, it took a while for humans to not see technology as that threat and instead to see it as the useful tool. But I think historically, we're now entering that period, which is exciting. So you're, you're being hopeful here, it sounds like. This is optimism, man. <laughs> um, going, go, going back to the question, I know I see that you're, you're resisting this question, but I, I still think that your work is so much based upon this protest against being silenced by whatever technology. Right. What we were talking about earlier, just the possibility of making. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always think of Dylan when I think of this. There's somehow there's the yesh mm -hmm. Somehow there's nothing, and all of a sudden there's something. And it seems, and and you are so generous in your wanting to find out about the other. What happens when that's not reciprocated, or what are the conditions in which that can be? That can be. I mean, is it is it historical? Is it Communal. I mean, I'm asking, is it temporal or, or? I mean, I think there 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 are a few different things there. I mean, there, there's the difference between. I'll try not to dodge this question. I'll go. I'll go at it. Right. I mean, I think there's the, there's the idea of imagining yourself into the world and imagining someone you're not. Right. And then the the question you're asking is, what happens when you feel like you're betrayed by that world? What happens when the world that you're trying to interact with, you're trying to communicate with? turns around and says, kike. Right. What happens when the world that you're trying to go out to and try and do this, they say, no, you can't talk. You're a, you're, you're a Zionist settler, colonialist, white patriarchal, whatever, whatever you want. And, um, and the answer to, my answer to that, I mean, that, that's essentially what you're asking. My answer to that is, first of all, it doesn't change my desire to imagine. It doesn't change my desire to communicate. It doesn't change my desire to inhabit. Right? In fact, it might only reinforce that. Mm -hmm. And second of all, it actually, I mean, and I'm very, I'm very diasporic in this sense, it makes me happy. I don't have that response of, of I don't feel offended. I don't feel angry. I don't feel frustrated. I say, finally, I'm a real writer. It's like almost getting, you know, it's like, you know, there's no such thing as like a writing badge or a writing medal. Right, where someone says to you, now you are a writer. The Pulitzer Prize isn't that? Oh, God, no, it's the opposite of that. There's what, no, what, what, why is it the opposite of that? Because it has to do with publicity and bullshit. <laughs> there's no moment where you, where you, where, there, like, there's no moment where I have felt more legitimate than when I'm opposed. It's in the opposition, the opposition confers the legitimacy because it tells me that right or wrong, I'm at least on a path toward 
affecting the world. I'm not actually just shouting into nothingness. I'm having something reflected back to me. And whether it's ref reflected back to me in a, in a negative spirit, in a condemnatory spirit, it, it, it doesn't matter. It, it actually, it, to me, it, it tells me that, um, that I am. And not only that I am, but that I am, um, that I have touched a place mm -hmm. that, um, that is real and that I, and that it's a sign that I need to continue in that direction. And that, that's, the problem is that when most people kind of have that sense, what I say of like, you know, you, you, you have that legitimacy conferred by opposition, they become coarse, they become crass. Mm -hmm. They think that, you know, if they yell and then somebody yells back at them, they yell louder. Mm -hmm. It's not what I'm talking about. I think what I'm talking about is, is, is understanding that the opposition has truth to it too. And it has beauty to it too. And it has a history of its own trauma. It has a history of its own um, uncomfortableness in its own skin. And that it's your job, it's my job as a novelist to, um, to show all of that and to take it all in and not just to um, scream back. Art is, art, is there a position that you don't try to identify with? Yeah. I'm asking about asking the same question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there a position I don't try to identify with? Yes, yes. The position is I'm a great and successful novelist and everything I do is amazing. That's one position I try not to identify with. But other than that, I'm kind of, I'm kind of open for business. Okay. You know, I mean, but you know, you, 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 I, I think the idea that I'm not going to be open to, 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 to something, I mean, openness doesn't mean that you agree with it. You know, I mean, I, how do I put it this way? You know, I think everyone in this room knows a lot about, I don't know, let's pick something out of nowhere, the Nazis, right? Nazis people? Right. <laughs> people know, These, you, know d d you know, does that mean you identify them, identify with them? No, it just means that, you know, you, you've taken them in, right? Yeah. In, in my sense, you know, what you're talking about is, it's, it's rejection is ignoring. Rejection is, is, is completely blocking out. And what you see in the world today, when it's, when it's by the way, when it's, when it's anti-Israelism, when it's anti-Zionism, or frankly, from an Israeli media bubble, when it's a sense of the Palestinian public, right? It is all um, blocking. It's all, the world doesn't want to hear about Israeli reality. Israel doesn't want to hear about certain Palestinian reality. No one wants to hear, no one, that's blocking. That's the complete opposite of what I'm talking about, which is, which is inhaling it all. Inhaling it all in order to contain it, whether you agree with it or don't agree with it, whether you hate it or love it, it's, it's the idea of it is your duty to intake it, identify, and in some way contain it. Because like it or not, it, what, it mean, what, what do you mean by contain it? I mean, live with, live with how it feels. You, you know, I mean, I, I, in many ways, it, 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 it's, and I understand, I mean, it's, it's a deeply painful and crazy thing, mm -hmm. but I do think that, that everyone has done this with almost every other tragedy in Jewish history. Mm -hmm. They can tell you why it happened, you know, and the reasons would be, you know, I'm sure you can ask anyone about any tragedy in Jewish history here and they can tell you why it happened. They can tell you why it happened politically, economically, metaphysically, spiritually, as a result of divine, they're all the same. Right, right, but I'm saying everyone could give you some reason about why something happened, but it would all be kind of siloed in its individual disciplines. But the point is, is that the, that's what I mean by containing. It's, it's being able to then keep up that chorus or that orchestra of explanations, because if, if we as a people have done sort of anything before building a state, it's we've explained. Mm. Mm. I'm just gonna ask one more question and then I'll ask you to, to maybe read for something for us. What happens when, the, when you're being asked to breathe something that's toxic? Part of you dies. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I yeah, a absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think that that's what, you know, here, 
has dealt with horrible death with murder, right? And that's not something you know that, that people here can and want to look away from, right? It's there. I think when you talk about something short of murder, which are the hateful ideologies that you're speaking about, you know, those are hateful ideologies that, you know, that I see every day. I just came from Scandinavia, from Stockholm, from, from Oslo. You see that on the street every day. I teach at our fabled Columbia University. Uh, I, I saw that every day. You're not able to teach class. You're trying to go to class to talk about Dostoevsky and people are yelling river to the sea and, you know, screaming. Um, you breathe it in. You see it. You breathe it in. And you, um, and you maintain it. And you go home from that hate. I go home from that hate and write. And there's no other revenge I know. You know, this is, that is New York. You don't, you know, you can't drop bombs on them. So the protest is, is writing. Yeah. It's also the only protest that pays money. <laughs> well, I'd I like, I like to get back to that. But, but, but um, you're going to read us something which is in a, an unexpected genre. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah, I can. I can. Just. Just a little bit, though. Okay. This is from a, a collection uh, in, called Miklat. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'll just read a few of these little things. This was. Um, they asked. I think it was the ITHL, the Institute for the Translation of Hebrew Literature, asked uh, Dr. Bolkstein and Maya Netan. And I to put together, yeah, thank you, to, to put together um, something very, very, very soon after the um, 7th of October, just sort of very, very quick, um, with a number of Israeli writers, some American writers. And I had, I translated a few of the, the pieces in it, and I, I was trying to avoid um, writing something myself, because who wants to write anything? And, um, and I really didn't know what to do, and then they were angry at me because they were like, you promised to give us something, and I, the truth is I really didn't promise, but they said I promised, so. Um, and so I didn't know what to do, so I just picked kind of a 30, and don't worry, I'm not gonna read all 30, there's no way of reading all 30. Um, little excerpts from my diary um, uh, of, of that time, um, and, uh, and I just kind of put them together um, and uh, into this thing called, I call Shloshim, it's from the diary. And they're all entries from between, I would say, October 10th through the beginning of December, I think, or November, and November. Um, So this is number one, and it's it's a, begins with a kind of a response to the open letter phenomenon about writing open letters. We, the undersigned, will not sign your letter. We are tired of letters, petitions, and masturbation. We are tired of the internet interpretations and death. We do not support murder but we also do not support kitsch. In fact, we call for the murder of kitsch in its sleep. We are liberal humanists who oppose the concept of liberal humanism, or at least the right to say the words liberal humanism aloud. We recognize all existence and all the differences that exist in existence and identify ourselves as contradictory plurals up to the point where identify with becomes apologize for, and we're also very sorry for all the scare quotes. We believe in God only as a precondition for hating God. We mourn with all mourners who respect our mourning. We do not want to get together to meet to drink tea, coffee, or anything stronger. Signed, Joshua Cohen, Joshua Cohen, Joshua Cohen, Joshua Cohen, Joshua Cohen. It just goes on like 18 times. 
Number two, an interesting, an interesting thing about being named Joshua Cohen is that there's always someone else named Joshua Cohen who's signing letters about Israel. The word pogrom, this is number three, the word pogrom is from the Russian pogrom, po, meaning by, through, behind, and after, cognate with the Latin post, and gromu, meaning thunder or roar. As most children know, lightning comes before thunder, or we only see the lightning before we hear the thunder. And now I, who feel like a child again, helpless, enraged, know what comes after pogrom, a post-grom, live streamed from the body cams of Cossacks on Jihad. Number four, what's surprising to me isn't the anti-Semitism I see. What's surprising to me is how many attempts it takes to decapitate a human with a shovel. I'll skip to number 11. Or maybe I'll go to 12. No, let's go to 11. A problem is that the teaching of history has been replaced by the teaching of theory, bringing in forms, structures, templates, and framings that result in the synonymity of struggles shorn of context. This is how, in the imagination of the global left, Palestinians become the black and brown people and Israelis become the whites. Ridiculous, absolutely, but it's somewhat consolingly funny to think of my old Yemeni landlord in Tel Aviv as a white guy. 12. The decolonizers never made much sense. Each generation contradicts its predecessor. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the guiding radical ideology was violence is speech, meaning that violence was the legitimate expression of a person or people whose words have gone unheeded. Then throughout the 80s and 90s, actually up until October 6th, the guiding radical ideology became the opposite. Speech is violence, meaning that the words you use can harm, so be careful how you use them, especially the words that don't belong to you, the words that don't belong to your identity. On October 7th and after, speech is violence, pivoted immediately to violence is speech, if only to contextualize, to justify, the slaughter of Jews as Palestinian liberation. Go to number 14. You'll just stop because there are a lot of these. Okay, great. All right. Number 14. The Hamasnik who called his parents to tell them he killed 10 Jews. It's hard to imagine being a full grown, mature terrorist still craving parental approval. Um, 19. If it is true, as they say on campus, that Israel is currently committing a genocide, then one day soon I expect to be at a party, if I'm still invited to parties, where a beautiful woman, or man, it doesn't matter, sips their martini and wonders aloud, how could, how could Khomeini have let that happen? Why didn't Iran bomb the train tracks? <laughs> Number 20. By all means, Iran should bomb the gas chambers. Iran should bomb the ovens. Iran should bomb the railroad tracks, if they exist. But because they don't exist, irony does. Oded Carmeli says to me something like, have you ever been on an Israeli train? Meaning, I guess, that no country can effectively commit genocide if their trains keep running late, breaking down, and then totally stopping on Fridays come sunset. Number 21. If I'd known that I could kill as many Jews as I wanted, and nobody in the world would care, I think I would have lived my life rather differently. <laughs> 22. They never kill the Jews you want them to kill. <laughs> it goes on. So that, that was a very different Joshua Cohen. Yeah. And does that Joshua Cohen feel better? Yeah, I don't feel all right. Yeah. Um, I, think, I, I picked the shorter ones in there. It's not all punchlines. Are, are, are you an aphorist? Now I am, I guess. I, I mean, I think some of your, the reason I ask you is because some of your paragraphs have this quality of being aphoristic, that they make certain demands of the reader. Mm -hmm. and, and that's another thing, that you write about your first book, the Schneiderman Variations, mm -hmm. that 
it's about a loss of a way of hearing or listening. And in some, I get the sense, I finished the book of Numbers and I was so depressed. I, I, mean, I, don't, I, I mean, because I think there's this sense of silence and what, what is possible. So, I like writing these little things. I don't know. I mean, these are just, I, I just try and write every day and then, and then they go nowhere, you know? And then, um, you know, you can collect them together when all you think about for two months or three months or four months or five months or six months is, 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 is the ongoing situation. The reason I wanted you to read the whole thing is just because there is a shape to these. You start out with a certain perspective and yeah. you kind of return to it at the end. Yeah. So even though you did it over that period of time, it was that kind of organic development that holds it together. Yeah, I mean, to read all 30 yeah. would have been a long stretch. But it's online. You can check it out. So I'm sure this is another question which will probably annoy you, mm -hmm. but I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, so you, you, you wrote a shorter novel. Um, I know it... It's, it's because you made more money out of it. You've said that, You've said that several times. And I keep on thinking yeah. Shakespeare also is in it for the money. I mean, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. um, so is that because, did you change the way you write? I mean, Wits and the Book of Numbers, you really enter into a world, and a world with its own laws. Mm. And with the Netanyahu's, we're, we're back to a reality that we can, we can kind of recognize. It, does that, is that because you've lost faith in, in your readers? No, it's because I got really angry. Mm. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I, I had this idea that even if I, if I lived to like the age of 200 or something, that, and I was on my deathbed. Baby will still be prime minister? Right, <laughs> yeah. Baby would still be prime minister. And the last thing that anyone would say to me was, you know, you remind me of Philip Roth. <laughs> we didn't say that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, with, and, <laughs> And I, and this was kind of when, you know, Roth had died. And I, yeah, I mean, you're gonna get a serious answer for this one because, you know, I, it was, it's that generation that sort of looms over things that came after. And I was tired of it. I absolutely just, I didn't give a shit. And it just, and it, it really, I was done with it. And I was, of course, thinking of Harold Bloom and, anxiety of influence and so on and so forth. And I said to myself, you know what, I'm going to write a book in the style of Roth, which is easy, because he did it already. Um, I'm gonna set it in 1959, which is his debut right. year, right? right? Goodbye Columbus, which is the year his first book came out. Or Echoes of the Human Stay. Yeah, but I'm gonna do it there. But I'm going to write about the very subjects that he I don't want to say ignored, but that all writers of that generation ne neglected. Mm. I mean, one of the things that you know, must be said, especially when you're talking about what is different about writing after October 7th, is that with the exception of Yiddish literature, which you know, lost its audience through assimilation in the United States and through some suppression and assimilation in Israel, mm. right? Um, with the exception of Yiddish literature, there, there wasn't significant novel about the Shoah in English for two decades afterwards. And it doesn't enter Roth's work until really the ghostwriter. It doesn't enter, you know, Bellow significantly until Mr. Samuel's Planet, which is very deep in the 70s. And Israeli literature, it has, Hebrew literature, it has other agendas, right? I mean, it lives in Yiddish. And, but America kind of goes this way to, you know, making out of the country club, and Israel goes, you know, in a quasi-socialist realist direction. And, um, and so I wanted to write a book about mid-century, mm -hmm. about the Shoah and about the founding of the State of Israel and about the Netanyahu family and what brings them to the United States. But in the style of the very writers who were avoiding that subject or were not interested in the subject at the time, you know, it, I always think if you could write in the style of a certain moment, you can't write about the subjects of a certain moment. There's some weird exclusivity, right? Where, 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 you know, we look in retrospect and we say, oh, you know, the central event of the 1950s was, in the Jewish world, was the first decade of the establishment of the State of Israel and the beginnings of true Jewish um, integration in the United States, the two largest Jewish communities in the world. Um, but 
I think in the moment, it, you know, with the exception of maybe, you know, Leon Yurst in the United States, who's kind of writing something that's already kind of propagandistic, and, and Israeli writers at the time who have their own kind of almost propagandistic instincts, um, the, these were not subjects that existed in that literature. So my idea was I was going to write a Philip Roth book about what Philip Roth was ignoring. So, so Ben Sion is the return of the repressed? In many ways, sure. Yeah. 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 So I wanted to talk a little bit about Ben Sion because as I was reading the novel, I, I had, I don't know until what page, but no sympathy for him whatsoever. Right? And then I got to page, let me just open up my book here, and we hear Ben Sion speaking. And it's quite extraordinary to hear what he says. He also made, he also made me think of my, my Uncle Morty. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my uncle, Marty, in a second. Um, the world is full, this is from a speech that he's given, or talk that he's given. The world is full of real events, real things, which have been lost in their destruction and are only remembered as having existed in written history. But Zion, because it was remembered not as written history, but as interpretable story, was able to exist again in actuality with the founding of the modern state of Israel. With the establishment of Israel, the poetic was returned to the practical. I mean, that's, that's a truism that's extraordinary, right? I mean, if you think of modernist literature, going back, no, they went back to the Greeks, they didn't go back to Greece, Pam, Joyce, you know? um, This is the first example ever in human civilization in which this happened, in which a story became real. It became a real country with a real army, real essential services, real treaties and real trade pacts, real supply chains and real sewage. Now that ex Israel exists, however, the days of the Bible tales are finished, and the true history of my people can finally begin. And if any Jewish question still remains to be answered, it's whether my people have the, have the ability or appetite to tell the difference. Now that's just so extraordinary, and I want to go back to it in a second, but there's another thing about Ben Sion. He says at a certain time that, um, he would die for, for, for a bloom, um, in a way that any Israeli would say in a believable manner. You, you, you bring out a part of him which is, um, I mean, aside from thinking every now and then, oh, he was right, which is what's keeping Bibi in office. He says, oh, I was right all along, except for October 7th. Um, so how do you account for this, this kind of shift between somebody who is really uh, it just, just their manners are so off-putting. And then you're able to see him from this perspective. I don't know. I think, you know, my, my relatives, uh, the Cohen brothers, you know, I think put it best in, in Big Lebowski where he said, you know, you're not wrong, you're just an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not following fully here, but okay. No, no, I mean, this is, you know, Benzio Netanyahu is not wrong, he's just an asshole. Right. And there's right. a difference. Right. right. It's right. a difference. Uh -huh. I mean, I think that that section that you read, yeah, right, is and Ben you're reading, you know, but that section you read is is Benzio Netanyahu goes to this you know, school in Western New York, and because he is a Hebrew speaker and uh, from Israel, the theology faculty, right, just assumes that he can teach Tanakh, or they don't call it, they, he teach Bible studies, and. So they say, great, go and teach a class in Bible studies to a bunch of like priests. They're like priests and nuns and whatever at that scene. Because they're like, oh, you should go teach him. And so, of course what he does is he gets up there and instead of giving them some, you know, Devant Torah or whatever, you know, Parsha Shavua, whatever, he gets up there and gives them a lecture on practical Zionism, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, and also like the, the proleptic poetics of practical Zionism. So, on you know, on one hand, he's right, but he's an asshole. It's not the right time to be doing that. And I think that that's that's important. Is 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 you know is is there, you know, in a way, I think that you know, and this is not to make him out to be any great figure, right? Um, but I think that 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 you know, in a way, prophecy. You know, we always have this idea, I mean, that's one of those words apparently that's above my head, sitting right under it like a guillotine. But um, 
That's for later. But yeah, but but you know, prophecy. We have this idea that that prophets are great people because they're deserving of it. But that's not how it works, right? I mean, it it, it prophecy comes through in. I mean, it, in the tradition, it comes through in in, in difficult ways from people who are stubborn and resist it and want to fight against it and in fact flee from it. And I think that, that you know, part of the beauty of attempting to approach a belief in prophecy is accepting um, that it comes from flawed people. It's accepting that the flaw might be intrinsic to the truth. Do you ever want to run away from, from your, let's call it, inspiration? Well, I'm at Bar Alam, so that's the first step. <laughs> I'm running away from my inspiration all the time. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wanted you to talk a little bit about this distinction that he makes at the end. I'm going to read the last sentence again. Now that Israel exists, however, the days of the Bible tales are finished, and the true history of my people can finally begin. And if any Jewish question still remains to be answered, it's whether my people have the ability or appetite to tell the difference to tell the difference between Bible history and the true history. Can you talk about that a little more? Yeah, I mean, or between story and history. You know, I mean, I think that, I think that there's a deep tendency, again, I mean, this is kind of, this is a nice way to kind of bring things full circle, what we're talking about, I think there is a tendency, you know, within the tradition to believe in story to kind of see the circular, repetitive, recapitulative elements of, 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 of Jewish existence, Jewish faith, repeating themselves, right? I mean, you see it when, I mean, I'm using big words here, but you, you see it when Bibi goes on TV and he talks about, you know, Amalek, you know, and then he talks about, you know, and he, and he talks about how this is not just a recapitulation of the 73 war, but he goes all the way back to Yoshua Ben Nun, you know? And if you remember anything before, they go back even farther, you know? And, and th there is that deep Jewish impulse to homologize, right? That, that is the, the Yerushalmi word, you know, in, in the book Zahor. That's the word that he's talking about, where you homologize one event with another, where you say that this is just another link in this chain. And I think that that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. But I think it is politically dangerous. I think it might even be politically disastrous. I think that, that, that the idea of being able to tell the difference between a story and history mm -hmm. is, 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 is necessary to survival. Mm -hmm. I think we tell ourselves stories in order to situate ourselves emotionally, to situate ourselves spiritually, to relate to the past, which is so remote. Mm -hmm. You know, we might have these ideas of what it was in the past, but the, the past is so remote that the only way that we can relate to it is, is by linking ourselves through these stories. But the idea that these stories are blueprints for conduct, mm -hmm. blueprints for action, mm -hmm. or even entitlements. Um, it, that's, it, to, to me, that's, that, 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 that's a disaster. Uh, but aren't your stories, and we'll, we'll wrap up and take some questions, aren't your stories also part of that history? You, you spoke early on when you won the Pulitzer about the way in which the story that you heard from Harold Bloom mm -hmm. was transformed through your imagination into something different. It's, it's like doubly mediated. Because right. He tells the story, then you tell, you tell the story. Right. And, and we feel the responsibility that you have to the story, your reverence for the story, but we also feel that originality. And isn't, isn't that, isn't, I, I'd like to break this distinction down between, I'd like to de-iconize the sacred mm -hmm. and talk about what you're doing as a form of the sacred going forward through going back. That's very kind of you. I, I feel like that, but that's also why I'm not Prime Minister. You know, I mean, I think that, I think that there's, I, I, without a doubt, my role or what I see my function as being is, is taking these story forms and reinventing them and remaking them and relocating them in certain ways. But I think it's, it, it's also my, part of my task to point out that that's precisely what's happened on the political level. I mean, not just in Israel, it's happened, you know, in, in, in many ways, the, 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 the homologizing discourse um, is something that is a classic discourse of a strong man's political playbook, of a dictator's political playbook. 
Um, but, also, see, but also based on theory and a history and, and yeah. without history. Without history, and I think you know, the, and I think that that if it's my if, if it's the writer's duty to kind of preserve and relate these stories, it's also the writer's duty to point out that we don't live in stories. We we, we live, and stories are part of our living. But, but to, to, to conduct ourselves within stories is very, very difficult. And I think that, by the way, that's also something that, that, that the Jewish people had thought that they had broken mm. by, by having the state. Mm. It's the idea that the, what is the Jewish story? The Jewish story is continuous victimhood. It's continuous death. It's in every country. It's in every nation rises up and then a male comes to destroy us and blah, 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 blah. And then the idea that that, that very story, that this country was invented in a way to oppose, is now thrown into question. And, um, and, and I think that that just speaks about the, the, the potency of these stories and how they shouldn't, they should be kind of treated like all sacred things should be treated with it say within their space. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. So we'll, we'll, we'll take some questions. We, we are very grateful that you're, you're here, especially after this um, odyssey that you seem to have had over the past 24 hours. Um, yeah. I'm still trying to formulate this question, so my apologies. But I want to go back to um, the question you asked about the National House and how it fits in with the, with the work of Philip Roth and looking at it more broadly, what it means to be an American Jewish writer. And so as I read The Ghost Writer, which of course was on my mind while reading The Ghost and House, I read it as Roth's attempt to reckon with the world of his fathers, right? And the Judaism of his fathers, the place he comes from, and his desire to be accepted in an American Jewish, in an American literary scene, as an American writer, full stop. Right? He doesn't want to have the adjective attached to him. He wants to be an American writer. And my sense from my reading of Roth's career more largely is that the answer to his question ultimately was no. He couldn't really be just an American. He was always seen as an American Jewish writer. And as I read the Netanyahu's, it strikes me that you're reckoning with a very similar question in this, um, this encounter between an American Jewish quasi-academic who in some, to some degrees is assimilated and to some degrees isn't. And you play with those questions so humorously and so brilliantly. Um, and then on the other hand, this beast of an Israeli who descends upon him bringing chaos and violence and wrecks his house and tells him bitter truths about things he doesn't want to think about. And isn't that in the end kind of the same question that Rock is dealing with? And you started this conversation by saying that the events that happened at our beloved institution aren't important. And yet, there's the first thing you agreed me with tonight. It is the first question that you chose to ask. And we're here in Israel talking about, talk, still talking about it when many more important things are going on around us. But I wonder, the reason I would say that they are important is that they reminded us yet again if we still need to be reminded that we're not American writers, we're American Jewish writers. And that the answer to that question is still no, in some kind of essential way. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, but I never felt, you know, look, what are my book titles? Cadenza for the Schneider by the Concerto Fitz, Netanyahu's book. I mean, I never, you know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't call the book like, American something. Yeah, I don't even know what that would be. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. No, but that's exactly what I'm saying. We're applying against America. Like, I, I never felt that way. You know, the America that I grew up in was not the one of post-war um, triumphalism. 
it wasn't um, it wasn't the, the counterculture uh, that seemed kind of fun. It wasn't when you could be on the bestseller lists as uh, uh, as a novelist. Forget Jewish novelist or not, the America I grew up with or I came of age with was the one that um, after September 11th, um, you know, went on to start you know forever wars, which just kind of ended, you know killing between 15 and 20 times the number of people that, you know, just in Afghanistan alone, and, you know, then Israel is probably killed in Gaza. Um, uh, a generation that then after that had to deal with a financial crisis um, and, uh, uh, and the rise of Donald Trump. So I never had that shine in my eye and I never really even had the paranoia of the postmodernists who thought, you know, everything, you know, the dark secrets might be true. I always knew the, the worst thing was probably true. Um, I didn't, I, I, so in, in my mind, you know, America was a complicated place uh, uh, to be a Jew as well. Um, I, 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 it wasn't sexy in Atlantic City, New Jersey in, in, in high school, um, it, you know, because, I, and so, and then my life after that became very international. I was living in Europe for six, seven years, and as a journalist, and and and, and running around, and and you know being in places which were once almost entirely Jewish, and then not at all. And so I just I never felt that shine in my eye. I never felt that that you know. Um, I never felt that that hopeful American spirit. Maybe um, I recognized the privileges and the advantages, the economic this and that. I, but I, they, it was never the, the writing world I responded to. Um, it, and yeah, and I, I never, I just never identified with it. I don't, I don't know. I always felt that America was like an excellent passport. It was an excellent mechanism to get to other parts of the world. It was a great language of, of transition and access. Um, but it didn't strike me as much of a, a culture, nor did it, nor did I ever fool myself into thinking that I had more than maybe a million's worth of readers who weren't Jewish, you know, um, and uh, and I, 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 and if I if I had a few non-Jewish readers before all of this, I probably have more non-Jewish readers now, but they're all hate readers, which is still a type of reader. <laughs> Thank you. One more question? Someone? Oh, yeah, Heather, please. Yes, I, I think uh, it was this in the Tanyahu, so I just sat and I read you through this book, but now I'm very curious and I'm full up for them. Um, so the question is what is true and what is not true about Dr. Bentley and the Tanyahu? And how much, you know, <laughs> yeah. how far can you go away from the reality? What, and what is the reality? And, and, was that a struggle for you to really think in those terms at all? No. <laughs> no. I, don't, you know, I, I, I grew up in, a, in Atlantic City, New Jersey, which, is, which was Trump's town, right? And I was born in 1980, so I was born about l less than a year after the first casinos opened. The first casinos were resorts opened in 1979. I was born in September of 1980. And I grew up surrounded by Trump. Right? Mm -hmm. I, um, my favorite, the, the bar mitzvah of, of Mikhail Traki Vidal, and I went to a school called the Traki Moshe Zechon Moshe Madonna. Um, the guests of honor, the bar mitzvah, Mikhail Traki Vidal, were Donald Trump and Mike Tyson. We were seated together. So, um, that was a name I had heard since I was born, Donald Trump. And Bibi, you know, has been a name that I've heard my entire life as well. He came to visit our school, right, back in the 90s when he was UN ambassador, right? He was, he was just around, you know, growing up in Atlantic City. You know, he had all these still good friends on the main line, Philadelphia, everyone around, and he would, you know, and so that was a name I had heard from childhood, as I'm sure everyone in this country has. And, there's something about just always hearing this name 
You know, you never think that you know the person, you just hear the name, it's a brand, it's like Coca-Cola. I don't know Coca-Cola, I just know the name. I don't know what the words Coca-Cola mean, but it's a word that I've heard. And the words, they, they take up a part of your mind. And for me at least, that causes me great resentment. I say to myself, why should I have this motherfucker's name in my head so much, and he doesn't know who I am? <laughs> no, no, why should I have to hear his name a thousand times a day, and he never hears mine? And so, there's, no, and there's, there's part of this, it's almost a zero-sum game of, of, of either they conquer your consciousness or you save your consciousness. And, and so part of this was just staking out this territory of being resentful about how much ground has been given up, how many years of my life have been given up to hearing about these people and their dumb families and their dumb children and their ex-wives and they're this and they're that. And why should I know all of this? Why? And, and so I just, so for me, it, it was this, I'm taking back the part of, I'm taking back the part of the consciousness that they took from me. And that's why the truth doesn't matter. <laughs> Coming. Thank you, Joshua. Joshua Cohn, Joshua Cohn, Joshua Cohn. <laughs> now in your mind, yes? Uh, so we look forward to hearing from you, seeing you in the next few days. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you.